Hey everyone, it's Jillian here. I just wanted to pop in before the episode starts and let you know that our interview with Lindy did go pretty long because we had so much to talk about. So we decided to split it up into two parts. So this week is going to be part one and then the week after next, we'll bring you part two. Thanks for listening. your horse's performance this season with choices from Purina Animal Nutrition. From Purina Altium Competition Formula to Purina Impact Pro Performance and everything in between, Purina has the right option for your horse, including supplements like Purina Super Sport Amino Acid Supplement, Purina Amplify High Fat Supplement, and Purina Outlast Gastric Support Supplement. There are many choices for optimal nutrition when you choose Purina, all backed by science. Level up your performance this season and put Purina's research to the test. Ask for Purina at your local feed retailer today. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of The Ride. This is Nicole. I am here with my co-host, Jillian Sinclair. And today we have an iconic guest with us, Lindy Birch. Most people are probably familiar with the name Cutting Horse Hall of Famer, Cowgirl Hall of Famer, World Champion. I mean, I could probably keep going on and on, but Lindy, thank you so much for doing this with us and and taking time to talk with us. Well, you're welcome. I'm glad to be here. Well, so first, I mean, I I think most of our our listeners are probably familiar with who you are. You are definitely a trailblazer for the industry and especially for women. But for those who might not be familiar with your background, can you kind of explain a little bit how you got started in horses in general? What kind of, you know, got you into this industry? I'll try to make it short. There's a short version, a medium version, and a really long version. I'll try the short one. I was raised in Southern California. My father rode horses, just pleasure horses, and did endurance riding, trail rides, things like that. So I pretty much grew up on a horse. I was the oldest of three kids, uh, a tomboy for sure. Always hung around the barn and the horses and started riding way, way before I could walk very well. So when I was about 14, 12, no, I guess it was 12, we, we saw a cutting horse show just riding around the country. And uh, in California, Southern California. So when I figured out what it was, my dad explained it a little bit. I said, well, that's what I want to do. And he said, well, I'm, I'm sure you can if you work hard and have the skill and, you know, work hard enough. You can do it. You can do anything, you know. So he he was right. I just worked really hard. It was kind of like fate. Uh, across the road, uh, about two weeks later after we I made this epiphany that I was going to, you know, train cutting horses. I was going to learn to ride a cutting horse. I didn't know I could be a trainer, but I wanted to ride. A cutting horse trainer moved in across the road. So I ran over there and said, introduced myself and said, I wanted to learn to ride a cutting horse. And he said, well, great. I, I'm a cutting horse trainer. And I said, well, I'd see that because it's written on your truck, you know. And he said, if you'll saddle 20 horses and clean 20 stalls and, and help me lope them, I'll teach you how to cut. And I said, oh, that'd be great. I said, what do I owe you for that? And he says, well, you don't owe me anything, but I'm not going to pay you either. So that's how I got started. And his name was Bruce Cahill. He was a great guy. And, and you know, before long, just riding his kind of horses he didn't want to ride. I used to load horses at the track for extra money. And I had a gentleman there that didn't want to pay me in money, but he traded me a triple A kind of broke down running mare. So I was happy to get the horse because I love horses. I don't care. And uh, Bruce said, uh, well, we need to get you a cutting horse. He said, that mare would be a pretty good brood mare for a, you know, quarter horse racing barn. Let's trade her. So he traded her for a 19-year-old hard front-end stopping horse named Mr. Nifty 121. And I was just thrilled with this horse. And I think he was more of a steer roping horse than a cutting horse. But we decided he'd be a cutting horse. And that was my first horse. That's how I got started. That's a short version. It definitely seems like fate that you fell in love with cutting and then two weeks later a cutting trainer moved in right across the street from you. What are the chances of that? 
That's crazy. So what was it, you know, like when you you first saw the cutting and then when you rode a cutting horse for the first time, what was it that like made you realize that's, that's what you wanted? You know, that's a great question. Very few people have ever asked me that. That's a really great question. My answer would be, it was just the biggest thrill I've ever had in my life. And I rode horses, like I said, from, I mean, after school, before school, rode in, you know, all kinds of stuff. But riding a cutting horse is unique. It is different than any other equine discipline that you can do because you turn it over to the horse and you and the horse work as a true team because you're not telling the horse what to do. There's no reining pattern. There's no mechanical way to know what the outcome is going to be when you drive a cow out and put your hand down because the cow pretty much has a mind of her own most of the time. And no matter, you know, the best laid plans about what this cow is going to do usually go awry pretty quick. So you and your horse have to, as, as partners, figure out the best way to control the cow. And that's where you get the highest scores. So, Riding a cutting horse and throwing your hand down and just having, you know, explode into a move at 40 miles an hour and then hit a stop and turn back as fast as the cow is doing. I just, I've yet to find out, find a, a stronger thrill on a horse than riding a cutting horse. I, I recently got to start riding cow horses. So not necessarily the cutting, but, you know, we do a little bit of cutting and that stuff. And uh, well, it's different. It's still that same kind of thrill. I, you know, I've ridden horses my whole life. And then a couple of years ago, I, I worked a cow for the first time. And I was like, this is a whole nother, another level of riding. It's just an insane feeling. It is. I, I agree. And there's, you know, Buster Welch puts it and and it's a quote that I uh, I always you know tell everybody and that is riding a cutting horse is is watching a contest between the cow and the horse with the best seat in the house and that's that pretty much depicts how it feels to ride a horse because you can't tell this horse what to do quick enough and he ha- he or she has to be thinking with you and trying to hold that cow as much as you want to hold it and so it's. It's it's a great feeling, and I haven't ever really given a lesson to anybody or seen uh, a new rider try cutting and not just be blown away. Pretty, usually about the second turn after you pleaded with them to keep their hand down, you know, you, you watch this big smile erupt on their face, and you see them just almost, they're bubbly because man or woman, because it's just so unique and so much fun and so quick and challenging and, you know, and all the strategy involved of how you pick cows and what cow will work the best and how long to work it and all these things. There's so many variables in riding the cutting horse. It never gets old and it never gets mundane because there's always something new. I mean, I've been doing this over 50 years. I, I just worked seven horses this morning before I got here, and I learned something new. I mean, I learned something new every day. That's, I think, what makes it so much fun. You bring up such a good point with, with the cattle. It, it's such an art, the cutting is, to be able to go and pick the right cow and, and study these cattle while they're in there. And, and even just learning to read a cow, both you and your horse. I mean, there's a, such an art to it. And, and I don't think people who have never worked a horse on a cow, like even truly understand what like a humbling experience it can be when you go out there and there's a, a rank cow and, and you're trying to figure out how to do all of that. It's just amazing. It really is, but you really have to give the credit to the horse when when it works because it's it's such a, a you know, just like people, there are, there are smarter horses than others. And there's more athletic horses and, and all that's required in a cutting horse. They'd be, they've got to be agile. They've got to be strong. They've got to be, you know, really strong in the hip and the loin to, to do those stops. But yet they've got to be like a ballerina with their front end to move back across the cow because they have to anticipate, they have to read, anticipate, and then do make that counter move to hold a cow. And each cow is different. So, that's the thing. It's not a pattern. And, and it takes, you know, it takes a long time to train one, a lot of experience, a lot of what I call turnarounds and trips to the herd before a horse really says, OK, I've got I'm, I'm getting the concept. So now if I step here on this cow, step a little bit further on this cow, 
you know, maybe I can stop it from running and then draw it to me, which is, you know, that money hole. That's what you're trying to do in the middle of the pan. And it's it's so rewarding to have a horse start doing that. You know, like I, I have, you know, two year olds I ride. I've got two, three year olds I rode today. And uh, when they start figuring that out on the cow, it is it's just the most amazing feeling. Like you, it's like a, a great teacher giving a college student the gift of learning where they can now take those those uh, skills and learn anything they want to learn in the future. And that's kind of what you give this horse. Because he moves on from the basics, stop, turn, stop, turn, stop, turn with a cow. You know, a good one will all of a sudden just start doing some other things like shimmies and move over here to keep that cow's attention. And, and all those subtle movements make a huge difference in the big picture. But to tell somebody about that, they go, oh, yeah, right. Uh, yeah, sure, Libby. But until they, until they feel it, they, they don't get it. Absolutely. I can't even imagine what that's like when you feel the feel them, you know, catch on to what you're teaching them. I, I know with I show in the all around and just for me, that's very rewarding. But when you're actually having them do it with another animal and, and that's just I need to ride a cutting horse. <laughs> it sounds like so much fun. If you do, it, yeah. most of the time it's worse than drugs. I mean, you, it, it's going to be hard for you to put it down. Yeah, that's what it seems like. I think oh, it would be so cool. So you've obviously ridden so many different horses throughout your career. Do you have any that really stuck out to you or that you, you know, have the, the most memorable experiences with if you had to pick one or maybe two, because I'm sure you had you so many. Different one. I mean, um, one is the most obvious one, but then there's so, I, I've had the privilege and been very, very fortunate to, to have a lot of really great horses and they make great trainers. I'll be the first to admit that. And they make successful trainers. But my best mare, of course, is Betcher Blue Plumes that, you know, I won the world on in 2000. And she's she was phenomenal because she wasn't, and for a lot of really good reasons. I mean, she was the most amazing athletic horse I've ever been on. But she wasn't very easy to train. And she didn't really decide to cut till she was five. And then... Like from five on, it was just like she took me to class every day. She was training me to be a better showman and be smarter about picking cows. And she showed me all that. But from her two-year-old year till her five-year-old year, she would show areas of brilliance on a cow. And she could do things so easy. So, you know, her, her stop was amazing. Her turns were amazing. She stayed low to the ground. But she just really could care less about holding a cow. She would hold it about a minute better than any horse you've ever seen. And then she'd just quit. And she'd just say, no, nah, not today. That's all I want to do today. And I just stayed with her. And all of a sudden, she, she had a little injury at the end of her four-year-old year. And I, I'd marked some good scores on her. But no, she wouldn't be consistent at all. Couldn't trust her. I, she broke my heart many, many, many times. And uh, where I thought I had her, but I didn't. And then everybody told me to give up on her, but I wouldn't because I'm pretty stubborn, as you probably read. But she had a minor injury where she had to have a, she broke a sesamoid in her hind foot. And it was just a little bitty piece she chipped off. So that we, we decided to take it out. So she had two months off, maybe three. And when I brought her back, she never looked back. Never, ever had a bad run on that mare after that. Never had a bad work. And so she was amazing in that way. And, and then, obviously, when I retired her at 12, she lived, you know, another 16 years where she was just my buddy in the barn. And first horse I'd turn out in the pastures every day. And she'd whinny when she heard me or see me. And she had, you know, a, a bunch of, bunch of great horses. And one of the mares she had was a mare I was reserved at the Paturity on. Luckily, she was a little easier to train than her mother. In 2015, a mare called Bet She's Smooth. And then she was a great, great mare. I loved her. I won a lot of money on her. And I'm riding her first son, a horse called Raisin Betts, that is four now that I really, really like. I think he's, I think he's special. I haven't really had the runs on him yet to prove it to a lot of other people, but I feel that he's very special. 
And then the other mayor I have to mention is a mayor called She's a Smarty Lena that, that, you know, when trainers talk about training horses, especially as many as I've trained over the years, usually you have good days, great days, not so good days, and bad days. She, I called her Cher. Was, I always had bar names for all the horses. Her nickname was Cher because she was a superstar. And she's she was born in 989. That's how old she is, or she was. And I was fourth at the futurity on her. But what makes her unique is I never, ever had a bad day on that mare. The whole time, the whole two years I trained her to the futurity and then did real well to futurity. And then for years after that, and I won over a quarter of a million on her. But she, I never, ever had a bad day. And I can't say that about any other horse I've ever trained. You know, and, and not that it was a terrible day, but it just, well... Just like people, I just feel like doing it today. I'm not as good. I didn't jump catch up ball like I should have. You know, just just not not your best day. Or questioning on a on a new technique. Cher never did any of that. Every day she was just she'd meet you almost with a smile and a whinny and that's what are we gonna do today? You know. I have to say, through all those stories, uh, one thing I really took away is how many iconic mares you've had. And I'm I'm such a big believer in mares, and I love them. I think they're such great show horses, and they'll give you their whole heart. And it sounds like you've had some really, really special ones. I've, I've had brilliant mares, and, and I'm you, you're preaching to the choir, because I think the mares, mare power is the key to, to everything. The key to making a stallion, the key to... to having a stallion or developing a stallion, I always look at the bottom side. And of all the studs that I breed to and the studs that I've raised, they've had great bottom sides. Like, bet he's a cat, like Metallic Cat. I owned his mother. Metallic Cat, bet he's a cat, bet on me. And uh, I thought this four-year-old was going to be a stud, too. But, but, you know, I had to make the choice either to keep training him as a stallion or just have a really good show horse. And at this stage of my life, I decided the latter. I decided I wanted a really good show horse. I didn't really want to get into trying to stand him and promote him and prove him the next 10 years. I want to just go show him and have fun. But I have, but all the stallions I've had are directly, I mean, the, the great mares are directly responsible for those stallions. And, and I think mares offer a minimum of 60%, and I think a lot closer to 70 or 75% of the genetic material that shows up in, in their project. It sounds like you were probably ahead of the time, too, when it came to the breeding side of that, because I know in the last, I don't know, maybe 15 years or so, we're hearing a lot more about mares, and I feel like mares are getting a lot more recognition than they maybe did in the early 2000s and the 90s and, and before but it sounds like you were, I mean, you were ahead of the curve with realizing that it's not just the stud, it, it's also the mare. And I totally agree. I, you know, like, like I said, I have mares. That's what I like to go towards. I, I would choose a mare over a gelding any day of the week. Yeah. And you're right. They, there's something about a mare that, you know, they give you their, their, their heart and soul. I think easier. I think, I think gildings are really fun and I've had some good gildings. But it's almost like they're going to be as good as you make them be that day. If if you, I mean, not make them is probably too strong of a word, but if you're on your A game, pretty much you can get them on their A game. But if you're on your B game today, they may not hold up their end of it, you know, or they may sure may not cover for you. Where are these mares I've mentioned? They were covering for me a lot of times. Stylish Bet was another great mare, Doc Stylish Show. Got out of bet your blue boons. I won a lot of money on her. She was a tremendous athlete, tremendous in front of a cow. She would really make her eyes water with the speed she'd get across the arena. So I, I just, I love mares. There's nothing like a great stallion, the power that they have. But like, I would put the power of Bet. And, and stylish bet right up against any stud. I mean, they were powerful, powerful mares. That's awesome. That's such a cool, just all the different mares that you've had. And you've obviously done a lot of breeding and, and working with younger horses too. So when you're looking for a prospect and you're trying to figure out if it's going to be, you know, make a good cutting horse, what are you looking for? Well, first I look at the mare, the mom. 
I look at the breeding, but that isn't the only thing I make my decision on. I want to see the confirmation and I, I and the mind, you know, but, but confirmation wise, I want to see, you know, a, a strong hip and I want the parents to have good hips, short back, strong loin, intelligent eye, good neck for balance. You know, I want to see an athlete. Stronger in the rear end than the front end. I want the front end a little lighter if possible. And and then I want to feel if they've got the affinity for a cow. You know, if they if they check into a cow pretty quick. If they'll check check back to that cow, you know, when I first start them as a two year old, I can tell that, you know, this this one might really be a, a heck of a heck of a prospect. So let's go back a little bit. You you mentioned how you got into the cutting and 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 where your love of it kind of create was created. But what was the next step? When did you decide? I know you said like you didn't even realize you could be a cutting trainer when you first started learning. When did you realize like this is I could do this? You know, I I started showing and I, I was I was winning a lot and they they'd have these practices. At, uh, in Chino at Rex Elworth, who was a old thoroughbred breeder in uh, Chino, California, where I, where I was raised, where I went to high school. And every Thursday night, they'd have a practice because he ran some cattle there, too. And I, th- looking back, they probably were the worst cattle in the world. But but for five bucks, you could cut, you know, that's what it costs you to work a horse, five dollars. You'd work two or three cows. and move on to the next horse. And every Thursday night they have this practice. Well, pretty soon after I worked my horse, the other people at the practice would say, Hey, you want to get on, you want to work my horse? And I go, sure. Cause I'd get on anything. I said, Oh yeah, the more the better. I mean, I, I didn't have near enough horses to keep me busy. So I'd, get, I'd work their horse. And then pretty soon somebody else asked me. And I mean, some of them rear up, go backwards on me, buck me off. I mean, some of them weren't very good horses. I'm not saying they were all good, but I gave it the full court press. You know, I kept working them. And, and then some people said, well, why don't you just, you know, take take this horse home and work it a couple of weeks and then bring it back. Tell me, let's see what you can do with it. And I said, okay. And he said, and I'll pay you. And I went, wow. So, so I said, okay. So, you know, I ran home and told my parents about this. And the only problem is I didn't have an arena at the house. I didn't have anything. So it didn't take long. And I, I got the kids in, the, in my FFA chapter. So I'm about 15. I'm not driving or anything. We built an arena out of two by sixes and railroad ties. We had to build a chute because the boys wanted to ride the heifers and steers we were going to get. And we used the, the FFA chapters show animals for my cutting cattle, which were heifers and steers mix. And we chase them all and get them gathered up and take them to my house. And I'd work them. And then the, then the kids would ride them out of the shoe. That was my cutting cattle. So, but the horses, somehow we all survived that. And they, you know, more and more people asked me to, to ride their horses. So it, I was, I was also, you know, that was like when I was 15, 16, 17. And then I went to school and went to you know, University of California, Davis. And I wanted to be a vet. That's what I wanted to do. So I didn't get into vet school the first year. I'm kind of skipping forward. So and I took a couple of horses up there with me to Davis and showed on the weekends and did, was still doing really good showing. So I thought, you know, maybe I should just ride horses. And more and more people asked me to ride. And it was just kind of like a natural tangent or a step to to start training and I still kept going to school and I got a, you know, I did some research. I, I did a research project and got earned my master's in mammalian physiology and my specialty was endocrinology. And I did some work there and I thought, well, well I'll just be a teacher, you know, if I can't get into vet school. Well, that didn't work for me because I didn't want to stay indoors. And I just, the natural evolution was to start training horses. So that's, I started training them when I was about, well, when I was out of school, I was probably about 20, 21. 
It seems like life kind of has a way of putting you where you're supposed to be. It seems like you were definitely made made to be a, a cutting horse trainer. You kind of started as a trainer without even really meaning to. So once that you kind of fell into that, where did you go after that? You know, how did you get to where you were having clients and then the farm and things like that? You know, it's it's so hard to break into the training industry. I can't imagine starting at 15. You know, I, I live with my parents, you know, till I was around 20. And I got married at, I think it was 22 or 3. It was so long ago, I don't remember. And that lasted five years or so. But we we had a place in Southern California, and we built an arena. And so I was taking horses and training there. And then I moved up to Escalon, California, and worked for Ed and Modine Smith. And they had a big barn. I actually, I started showing up there. I was showing one summer. And they liked me and they liked how I worked a horse and they they knew I was, you know, about to be, you know, single and free. And so they said, we'll just move up here and train out of our barn. So that's how it started. I never, I never was able to go work for another trainer just because I was always in school, but like, like the kind of the standard way of train new trainers coming up there you know, their second hands or protégés of another trainer. I never got to do that, but Larry Reeder took an interest in me, a tidying horse trainer, and, and asked me to come up and work with him a couple of times, which I did. But Modine and Ed gave me my, my first really big start on a, on a really good open mare name, Miss Safari, that I started showing. And, you know, and, and the, the ultimate is always if, if you're competitive and you win, People, you know, will respect that. And they started, you know, asking me to take other horses. And I was just, it just kind of bloomed from there. And then eventually I, I bought my own place in Clements, California. And that was kind of set up already with an indoor and an arena barn. So I trained out of there for a long time until I went to Carmel Valley and trained there. So during that process, you eventually won the, you know, Cutting Paternity Championship, and you were the first woman to ever do that. Can you kind of explain, you know, how you got there, what it was like to win that title, and, you know, how that kind of helped you grow into who you are today? I won the Pacific Coast Futurity, I think, in 76 or 7. I'm not positive about that without looking 76 or 77 late 70s and then so I was I was getting pretty well known on the west coast but the, but you know the big horses and and the you know the ultimate was of course Fort Worth so I had a mare that Bill and Sue Long sent me named Diamond in 1978 and they the only reason I got her is that she bucked off a real cutting horse trainer and they he didn't want her anymore, so they sent her to me. And uh, I just fell in love with this mare from the start. And uh, she was just a, a great, great mare, and her name was Diamond Mystery. And her mother was a Pocodell mare named Comodella. And she was, but Mystery was by a, a running horse called Diamond Jigs, which was, I think Bill was ahead of his time. He wanted to try to breed an outcross. So this mare wasn't traditionally cutting horse bread on the top. But a really, really great mare. So I trained her all year and took her back to the Futurity and was second. I tied with Leon Harrell in 1978, 79, sorry. 78, I missed the finals. I, I catch rode a horse for Larry Reeder in 78, Miss Lena Barrett, and I missed the finals by half a point. So I went back in 79 and was reserved, co reserved. And then I rode another horse for Larry in 1980 and won it. And uh, I was, you know, as you say, I was the first woman to win the, the NCHA Open Futurity. And there's only been another one since then, which is the gal that worked for me, my very good friend, Kathy Dawn. And, and then I've been reserved twice since I won it. But, but what it did for me is, is just whenever you win something like that, more than anything, more than the winnings or anything else, you, you gain confidence, which is more important than anything. And I and I felt like I could ride with anybody and I could show with anybody, and and that that in itself was was probably the greatest gift that that you could get from winning something like the Futurity. And you know, I used to get tired of people asking me, "How does it feel to be a woman?" or you know. 
how'd you do it and all that. And I thought, I never really thought twice about the gender question, women or woman or man. I just thought, you know, I wanted to be one of the best. And to be the best, you have to show against the best. And the best all happened to be men. It never really dawned on me that it was a big deal that, that I was winning being a woman. It just... I always wanted to be considered a really great hand, one of the best, not one of not one of the best women. So, but it, it, I think the confidence was the big thing, and just the, you know, you could not that I've ever relaxed. I, I don't think I'm relaxed now about about it because I want to win it again and again and again. But it it just makes it a little bit easier to sleep at night when you know that you can win it. I, I think you bring up a really good point with the 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 questions that are asked about what's it like to you know to be a woman that won something like that. And yeah. And it go, it kind of goes back to the whole conversation that we had about like a good, you know, a mare is just as good as a stallion and and a female rider is just as good as a male rider and and you know they should be compared on the same you know scale, not female versus male. Like you, you are one of the best cutting horse trainers, not just female cutting horse trainers. Right, right. And I think that that in 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 anything, you know, when you're the first, you know, and 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 whether I'm referred as they refer to me as Jackie Robinson of you know cutters and all that, break the glass ceiling. I think in retrospect now, I think it was a big deal. I didn't think it was a big deal then, you know. And I, I think that it's just having having a focus about what you want to do and then sacrificing whatever you have to sacrifice to get that done. And I think, you know, a lot of women are as good. You know, there's many, many really great women hands. And I think they have a lot of times a step on some men, not all men, some men, as as being a better partner with a horse. I think they're more intuitive. I think they're more compassionate in many in many ways. But not not, you know, I, I don't wanna I don't wanna, you know, be a racist on the other side saying that men can't do it, because they can. There's there's some great male trainers and there's great male trainers that have a, a tremendous amount of compassion for their horses. I just see it a lot in women too, and I it, and and our industry has has evolved where we have a non-professional class, as you know, and an amateur class, and those are dominated by women. There's more women in the amateur and the non-professional than men that are winning, for sure. And there's still some good non-pro males and non-pro and amateur, you know, men, but but there's a lot of women. And in the open, they're still way dominated by the men as far as number-wise. There's still just a few women open trainers. But, you know, there's a lot. That there, I'm not saying you have to give up everything to do that, but but it's taxing. You know, the, the family life is taxing. The, the responsibilities, you know, are all kind of askew, and you have to... You have to wear a lot of hats if you're a woman and still be a woman professional trainer. And there's some that are very successful at it and good, good hands coming up that are ladies. So, you know, to, to get to be the start of that, I'm I'm happy with that. And and I'm the only woman yet to win the world, to win the Open NCHA Open Championship title. And I think that, you know, we'll have women win that one of these days too. But, it, you know, it just... You got to be in the business a while, and that's got to be your focus in order to get to to get to the top, as in any sport, business Absolutely. or sport. You know. Absolutely, there there is a, a level of dedication, and and I think horses. You know, the nice thing about other sports is that you can walk away from your baseball bat at night, or. You know, whatever. And, but, you know, when we're done riding horses, next you got to go and, and take care of them, medicate them, feed them, clean stalls. You know, there's no, you don't get to just go to your job and, and ride. You got to do everything else on the other end afterward. No, and then you don't get Sundays off or Saturdays off or, you know, you can put the bat in the closet and take a day off. But, you don't, you know, the horse life, the ranch life, horse life, I wouldn't trade it for, anything in the world and and I'm certainly not trying to dissuade anybody from doing it because it's the love of my life for sure but but 
it's you know it's it's not for everyone i mean you 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 know you have to be super responsible and compassionate for these animals because they depend on you that's that's they depend on you for their life all right that's it for part one of our interview with lindy birch so tune in on may 23rd for part two